Father, we do thank you. We thank you so much for you. Lord, we also thank you for your word and in it how you have left us with so many instructions that, that we would know how to live for you in these last days. Father, help us now to hear you. Help us, Lord, to, to really understand and accept what you have in your word. Lord, we need you. We need your word. We need your Holy Spirit to, to really give us the understanding and to quicken our hearts to your word. Father, please speak to us now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of uh, this evening's uh, teaching is Parting Exhortations. And, you know, if you've ever went on vacation and you had somebody house sit for you, how many of you guys have, have had that happen? have done that. Okay, few of you. All right. Uh, you know, even if they're just going to come over daily and, and take care of some things for you, like feed your animals or uh, you know, take the mail in or whatever, you know, it's the last instructions that you leave with them is usually the most important, right? Like if you're, you're going to go, you say, okay, you know, put the mail over here on, on this counter, and if we get any packages, then leave them out here in the garage and, you know, in this spot over here, and don't forget to feed the fish in our daughter's room. <laughs> and, you know, you may talk about several other things, you know, before you go, but driving out of the driveway, you may, you know, look back, hey, remember, don't forget to feed the fish, because you don't want to, to come back home and find that that fish floating at the top of the aquarium, right? Or the little fish bowl thing, whatever it is. <laughs> like that happened to our daughter, and I think most of us have had that happen. If she came in one time and said, Mom, Dad, my fish is asleep and I can't wake it up. <laughs> it's laying on its side. So we had to do the obligatory funeral at the toilet. <laughs> but you want to avoid that, You're breaking your kid's heart, right, if you can. So it's like the last thing you say, don't forget to feed the fish kind of thing. And tonight we look at Peter's exhortations as he closes this first letter out. And there's some, they're pretty important stuff here. So uh, first, Peter addresses the elders. Look at verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. The word elder there, we're going to see a couple of different words tonight for leaders within the church, but it's presbuteros. Uh, we get the word presbyterian from there. And it's usually translated elder or elders. There's only one place that I know of, at least in the New King James, where it's translated not as elder, but uh, in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, it's older man and older women. Uh, but everyone knew here Peter was an apostle. He was one of the 12. <laughs> and as such, they knew that he was writing as an apostle under the Holy Spirit's inspiration. But here he gives them another reason to accept what he's writing to them. He says, I who am a fellow elder. He's writing to elders, and he's saying, hey, I'm, I'm one of you guys too. <laughs> you know, uh, when I'm writing to you, I'm writing to you as a fellow elder. I, I'm, I'm practicing this too, what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you to do something that I don't do myself. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he reminds them that he witnessed the sufferings of Christ. In other words, I was there. I, I was with Jesus. I heard all of his teachings. I, I walked with him for three and a half years, and I was with him when he went through his sufferings. And in other words, the things I write to you, I, I didn't get secondhand. You know, I'm writing to you things that I picked up walking with the Lord, even to the point of watching him suffer. And remember, he's writing to a church, probably in Asia Minor, that is suffering. They're suffering persecution. It's 64 AD. Nero has started his persecution of the church in earnest now. And he reminds them and us of our reward in heaven. He says that he's uh, going to be partaker of that future glory. Uh, and it's because of his faith in Christ that he expects that. Uh, but also, the thing is, we know from all the, the uh, other scriptures that we've looked at, uh, we know that the Word of God talks about that we will all be rewarded uh, 
really for what we've done with our faith uh, if we're faithful to the Lord, which is where Peter is going with this, talking about those future rewards. And so now he gets the exhortation to the elders, verses 2 and 3, he says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Now, that word shepherd is uh, uh, poimaino, <laughs> poimaino. Uh, and it can be translated a number of different ways. Uh, here and in most passages, it's translated as shepherd. Someone who cares for the sheep, feeding them, leading them to water, leading them to green pastures and protecting them from predators and caring for them when they're sick or injured. But it can also be translated to tend or tending. Uh, It's what Jesus said to Peter when when Peter had denied him three times. Well, Jesus restored Peter, giving him three opportunities to say he loved him. And in John 21, 16, Uh, He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He, that's Jesus, said to him, tend my sheep. And that same Greek word for for shepherd or tend, uh, it it really involves uh, the same thing. It's doing what a shepherd does for the sheep. And the same word could also be translated to serve or serving Uh, in Jude. As Jude is warning uh, the, his, his readers about these false brethren that had come in among them, in Jude 12, he says, These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. You kind of get the hint that he's not really crazy about these guys, huh? <laughs> these are some bad dudes. Uh, And and so here uh, you see that it can be translated serving, uh, but that same Greek word can also be uh, translated rule. Uh, And all of the instances that I'm familiar with, uh, that word when it's translated as rule, uh, in the New King James at least, have to do with Jesus. In Revelation 2, 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Again, same word as shepherd, to rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And this is Jesus speaking. And then Revelation 12, 5, she, that's Israel, bore a male child, which is Jesus, who was to rule, again, same word for shepherd, all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. And then Revelation 19, 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Peter says here that we're to shepherd the flock of God as overseers. And that Greek word is uh, episcop. <laughs> I always get episcopeo. It's where we get our word episcopal from. Uh, The Launita Greek uh, lexicon defines that word as to have responsibility for the care of someone, implying a somewhat official responsibility within a congregation to minister unto, to be responsible, to care for. Now, that word, episcopeo, is only used twice in the New Testament, here and in Hebrews 12.15, where... In the New King James, it's translated into two words, looking earnestly. But I think the, the NIV uh, brings out the meaning of that word there uh, a little bit better. Hebrews 12, 15 in the New International Version, words that see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Speaking to the elders there, he's telling them, see to it that no one falls short. In other words, the elders have a responsibility to help those around them, to care for them, to to do what they can so that no one under their care falls short of the grace of God. It's the idea of a person who is responsible for directing and watching out for others. 
<laughs> like a manager of a business, you know, he's working for the boss, managing the company, but here it's the focus is on the well-being of those that you're responsible for, uh, which is what a shepherd does for the sheep. You know, he leads them, they follow him, they trust him, and they know he's taking them to green pastures and still waters. They know he's going to care for them if, if they get hurt or he'll protect them from the wolves. And the shepherd here, like a manager, like an overseer, he's saying, as an overseer, see, the shepherd is accountable to someone else for the well-being of the flock. Because in most cases, still today, but especially back then, most of the time the shepherd wasn't the owner of the sheep. He was working for the owner. He had been hired to manage the flock, to care for them. And you could go and, and look at Genesis 29 and, and chapter 30, uh, and you see how, how um, Jacob was a shepherd, how he worked for Laban, his uh, father-in-law. And he, it was kind of a mess, but you could see that, that he was the shepherd there, and he worked for someone else, his father-in-law, who was a snake just as bad as Jacob was. <laughs> but here Peter is telling the elders, those who are responsible for the care and feeding of God's flock, to shepherd them as an overseer, as someone who's going, going to have to give an account, someone who is responsible They've been given the responsibility of the well-being of that particular congregation. You know, you're going to have to give an account there. You do it as an overseer, like one who gives an account. And just kind of a side note here, although there are three different Greek words for elder, pastor, and bishops, they're all used interchangeably in the New Testament. They really speak of the same role. But Peter also tells us, how elders or pastors or bishops are to shepherd or lead as overseers. You know, yes, they answer to God, but also, he says, not by compulsion, but willingly. Some translations say not out of obligation. It's the idea of somebody that is pastoring should not be being forced to, to oversee the flock, to be the pastor, but he should be willing to do that. You know, I got to thinking about this today, and it really is a truth that there has to be a balance there. In thinking about someone who's willing, uh, you know, you don't want somebody that is too eager to be the pastor. And the reason that is sometimes is because I want to be the boss. You know, I get to rule the church kind of thing. Oftentimes, I was just talking to, to Steve, and uh, you know, Mary and Steve, they came from uh, another Calvary Chapel, and somebody that was under uh, that, that senior pastor uh, did not want to, to be where he was at, and so he went out and he started a congregation and, and caused a church split uh, and, and really did a lot of damage to the church that he came out of. And the thing is that it fits with what I'm saying here, when I'm, what I've seen over the years. I've, I've been walking with the Lord for 47 years, 48 years, something like that. And a lot of times those people, they're self-willed. They're unwilling to submit to anyone. So they're eager to start their own church kind of thing so they could be the boss. That's a horrible reason to be the pastor of a church. Your heart isn't in serving the people, they're not in caring for the people, nor for uh, how the Word of God is handled, man. It's just all about you. And, and fitting, you know, with this whole deal, those kind of churches, those kind of pastors that are all too eager to be the pastor for the wrong reasons, they never last. They damage people. We saw it when we were at Tucson, right, Anthony? We saw people, you know, and uh, start churches. Church fails, and then those people that they led uh, with them, they end up being so skewed, so banged up from the whole deal, disillusioned. Sometimes they walk away from the Lord, but sometimes they, they're still walking with the Lord, but they can't go back to where God had called them to serve at at that church because they had been so polluted by those people that were so eager to be a pastor. It's, that's a dangerous thing when somebody... It's like that. And I'll just tell you, I never wanted to be a senior pastor. <laughs> but 
I was totally content in that supportive role as an assistant pastor in Tucson. God was using me, and, and uh, you know, I, I was blessed in, in all. I was very comfortable there. Uh, but once God convinced me that he was calling me here, then we began the process of moving up here and, and say, okay, God's calling me this. And, you know, I don't even know. Uh, in fact, I know that I did not ask uh, how much I was going to be paid or even if I was going to be paid. Uh, I, I, I don't recall it even having a conversation along those lines. I just figured, well, okay, you know, if God's calling me here, he'll take care of me. I'm not going to worry about it kind of thing. Uh, I all right, if that's what he wants, I was willing to do it, uh, but hey, I just wasn't, you know, wasn't really looking for that. But that's another reason why some people want to be the pastor or, or even sometimes being on staff at a church. It's for the money they think they can get. Peter addresses that here next. He says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. And unfortunately, we hear all too often about pastors and ministry leaders getting caught embezzling from the church or from their ministry, don't we? That's a sad thing. You know, not being eager to serve and to give of themselves, that's the problem. They don't want to serve. They're, they're not eager to serve to give of themselves, but uh, we should be. Uh, give of ourselves to God's flock and his, his ministry there. But uh, these people, they, they see that position as a way to take for themselves whatever they could get away with. Uh, and a pastor is to get paid. There are some, and one of the cults that's real big up here, they will ridicule Christian churches because their pastor gets paid. Well, it's because they don't really anchor what they believe in the Word of God. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 9.14 says, Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And really, most of chapter 9 deals with that there in 1 Corinthians. But in 1 Timothy 5.17 and 18, Paul wrote to his protege, uh, Pastor Timothy, he said, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while, he, while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. I, I like the way that the, the New Living Translation words verse 17 in 1 Timothy 5. It makes it real clear. He says, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. Simple, right? It's one of those deals. I'm blessed that I don't have to work outside of the church. Uh, you know, I'm kind of available 24-7, you know, 365. If, if, if something happens, you know, I, I'm available for that. Now, it doesn't mean that you could be rude and call me at 2 in the morning just to chit-chat, okay? So don't do that. But if there's an emergency, some of you have, have been there and, you know, uh, been there late at night and, or whatever, uh, you know, okay. You know, that's, that, that's I, I'm to serve anyway. Just having the paycheck from the church makes it to where I don't have to be obligated to work someplace outside of the church, so I am available there. You know, Chuck Smith used to uh, used to say, uh, and he actually he taught several times that I heard him that there are two uh, first priorities uh, for a new church plant. That number one, as soon as possible, pay the pastor for those same reasons, so that the pastor uh, can be available, but also so he could spend an ample amount of time studying. You know, if you're going to handle the Word of God correctly, you've got to put time in it. You have to stick your nose in that book, and you, you've got to rightly divide the Word. You've got to compare this Scripture with that Scripture, and what does this mean for sure, and how does that relate to this place over here in Scripture? You've got to be able to do that. You know, I always kind of think of it like preparing a meal for you guys. 
and you guys don't deserve hamburger helper <laughs> or a bowl of cold cereal in the morning or whatever. Although I don't mind cold cereal. You know, if my wife is, she's going to listen to this later. Uh, you know, I don't mind it really. But I, I believe that I should do the best possible for you because you are God's people. You're God's sheep. You deserve to be well fed. You know, that's, that's my desire. So I spend a lot of time. I, I, and, and so I'm blessed by that. And that's why Chuck said you know, need to pay the pastor as soon as possible. But the second thing is get your own facility. That way there's a consistency of where and when you meet. If you're borrowing somebody else's building and they decide, oh, we're going to have the carpet replaced. Uh, it's going to take the next two weeks. So you got to find someplace else. It's like, oh, <laughs> that's a drag. So, you know, those were the two things. But the next, next aspect of being an elder or pastor, Peter addresses in verse 3. He says, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. And there's a lot of confusion as to what lording over someone means. Uh, the, the Greek word there is, is so long, and I don't want to entertain you by my mispronunciation, but the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance it defines that word as to bring under one's power, to subject oneself, to subdue, or master. And the second definition is to hold in subjection, to be master of, or exercise lordship over. One of the commentaries uh, on this says that it includes the idea of domineering uh, as in the rule of a strong person over one who is weaker. You know, we, basically a bully. <laughs> We've seen bullies uh, when we went to school, right? And I was bullied. I was a little guy. <laughs> I know what it's like to be bullied. You know, but when I was 16, uh, my first driver's license, height, five foot three, weight, 98 pounds, I was the proverbial 98-pound weakling, and uh, yeah, I, I got bullied, <laughs> kind of thing. But that's the idea of it. And uh, you actually see this um, used in one verse in the Bible to describe what a demon-possessed person did to some people that were trying to cast him out that weren't Christians. In Acts 19.16, it says, Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, same Greek word, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. You know, beat them up and they had to take off out of there. And it's interesting to me that God had Ezekiel rebuke the leaders of Israel. They were supposed to be the shepherds of Israel, but he rebuked them for ruling in that way for bullying the people, for being harsh and cruel. In Ezekiel 34, 1 through 4, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and, the cl and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat legs, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. Now, the rest of the chapter, God tells them what he was uh, going to do, how he was going to hold them responsible, and that he was going to raise up someone else who would care for his flock. When James and John had their mommy ask Jesus uh, to, please let my son sit, one on your right hand, one on your left. See, the, the thing is what a lot of people miss, but when you read on, and we're going to do that in just a second, it had the whole concept of, okay, he's going to be a king, and we know the scripture says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. Well, we get to do that too. I want to be on his right and his left, you know, the, the next in line with power, with authority. And that's what's behind that. <clears throat> and so Jesus, after he told me, you don't know what you're asking. <laughs> you ain't got a clue. And the Israel, you think you could drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you, you don't understand. <laughs> but 
when, when that happened, then he called the disciples to himself, and this is what he said to them. This is the context, right? After James and John had mommy asked Jesus, you know, Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, the Gentile rulers, they ruled their subjects by force. They used their position of authority, not for the good of the people that they were supposed to serve, but really to benefit themselves. And... You know, if you ever watch any of the Robin Hood movies, you can kind of see that, you know, the whole Sheriff of Nottingham and, and, and you know, how um, Robin Hood was trying to make things right, but how the priests and the sheriff and uh, all those in leadership were corrupt and how they were there serving themselves, what they could tax the people out of just for their own coffers, for their own good and all that. But uh, they... They threatened, uh, you know, they either used the power of the government to hold the people under subjection, uh, or they would threaten punishment if they refused. But Jesus showed us a different type of leadership, a servant who leads. And that's why Jesus is often called the servant king. He was a servant, but he was also at the same time king of kings. He was, he was the, the leader, no doubt. Jesus could use no better example of this than himself. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And when you read the gospel, there was never any doubt as to who was in charge of Jesus' earthly ministry. Never any doubt as to who was leading. <laughs> that was always Jesus. There was no doubt on that, no question. But you never see him grab one of the the disciples or somebody that was there that he was teaching, grab them by the collar and say, I said, do this. Didn't do it. Wouldn't say that. But the thing is, Jesus did give commands, didn't he? You know, I, I think one of the tougher ones was you talk to the rich young ruler. All right, you know, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come back, follow me. You know, oh, and pick up your cross and follow me, right? Jesus didn't force that guy uh, to do that. <laughs> he told him what he needed to do. And he could not follow Jesus unless he obeyed the Lord. And the young man went away, the scripture says, sorrowful, very sorrowful. Because he wasn't going to do it. <laughs> and I think that's a good way to handle things within the church. You know, a, a pastor, or elder, you know, is responsible for the care and feeding of the flock of, of God's sheep that, that he is called to oversee. And if one of the sheep doesn't want to be led by that shepherd, well, okay, go to a different flock. <laughs> you know? go, go find a, a shepherd that you can submit to kind of thing. We've seen it before and we'll see it again. There's a responsibility of those within the church to submit to the leadership. And it's the thing is, there's so many scriptures about it and we've covered it before, but you know, it, it's a deal that no one is supposed to sow discord among the brethren or the sisterin, as the case may be. <laughs> but, but you don't agree with the pastor and the elders and how they're, you know, the direction they're going? Well, go someplace where you can agree with them. Go someplace where you don't have to sow discord. You don't have to fight every time, you know, the pastor says, okay, as a church, we're going to do this. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> but within the church... We're, the leaders are to lead by being examples to the flock, Peter says. And it's not just to example by being doctrinally sound. And I, I hope I set that kind of example, that when you hear me teach, if there's a couple of different ways that something can be understood, I usually say, well, some people believe it means this, and, and this is the reason, and some people say it means this, this and I tend to lean on this side, and here's why, and all that. And I try and be as absolutely honest as I possibly can to the text of the Word of God. 
But that's not the only place that I or, or the elders uh, are to be examples in. Yeah, we're to rightly divide the word of God, but we're also to be examples in how we live out our faith, how we practice what we believe. Hebrews 13, 7, he says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. What's the outcome? Well, they're teaching you this, but what's the outcome of their conduct? How do they apply? How do they implement what they're teaching you? Remember, Jesus warned his disciples about the scribes and the Pharisees and all that. <laughs> and he says, yeah, do as they say, because they're sitting in Moses' seat. They're the leaders there, but don't do as they do. <laughs> and I never want Jesus to say that about me. I want to do what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not perfect. You know, far from it. Uh, but when, I'm not, when I fail at something, then, you know, it, it's a deal where I, I confess my sin to the Lord and I make things right and then I commit to, I don't want to do that again. Help me, Lord, not to do that again. And if a pastor or elder's life isn't Christ-like, he should probably do something else for a living until he gets it right. But as leaders within the church, we're to be a pattern of a Christ-like life. And Paul told the Philippian church that in Philippians 3.17, Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. And if we'll do this, there's going to be a reward. Look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. That'll happen at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be rewarded for what we've done with our salvation and with the gifts and positions that God has entrusted to us while we're here. Verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. The word submit is the Greek word hupatasso, and we've talked about it before. It means to submit or to be in submission to. Um, sometimes it's translated obey, but it comes out of the Greek military language. It simply means getting in order according to rank. That's what hupatasso means. And God has established order in all of his creation, right? When we were in Ephesians 5, uh, you know, we saw that he has that order within the family. Children are to submit, upatazo, to their parents, wives to their husbands, husbands to the Lord. And we saw in chapter 2 of 1 Peter here that God ordained authority within the civil government. There's an authority structure there that he's ordained. We saw 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14. We're told, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. And God has established order within the church. And in each case, there's to be a willing submission to God's established order. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey, there again, hupatasso, those who rule over you, be submissive, again, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. <laughs> and I can tell you tonight, I'm not just blowing smoke, but you know what? It is a joy to serve you folks, to serve as your pastor. It is a joy. And there shouldn't be power struggles within the church. And that is something that really sucks the joy right, right out of being a pastor. But, you know, if someone has ideas, you know, you see something that needs to be changed or fixed or something, hey, let's talk. I want to hear about it. If you think one of the leaders are sinning or going in the wrong direction or maybe has offended you, well, then I encourage you. Do what the Scripture says, all right? Scripture addresses it. Jesus addressed it. You know, if you think a pastor or elder or, you know, whatever has offended you or is in sin, well, Matthew 18, Jesus talked all about what you do there. You first go to that person by yourself. And again, you've heard me teach on this before. It's always with an eye on reconciliation. 
It's never just to make your point. It's always to make things right and, and to reconcile the relationship between you and him, between you know, all of you and God. But if, if he won't listen, then Jesus said, bring a witness, somebody that's already aware of what's going on kind of thing. Say, hey, it's not just me, but we, you know, both of us have seen this. If he still won't listen, then he says that you're to tell it to the church. And what that usually means is to tell it to the leadership of the church. You tell it to, to those that are leading the church. And, uh, you know, if I'm messing up, well, we got two of the elders right there right now. You know, Glenn's over there and Anthony over there. You know, if I mess up and, and I won't listen to you, there they are. You know, you can tell them, hey, man, he's <laughs> doing this. He shouldn't be. He said this kind of thing. But... Uh, there, there may come a point that I have heard of churches where there's a lot of nepotism there, where the pastor has his whole family on the board of elders, and everybody that's in ministry and leadership is family, and even if the guy's messing up, nobody will confront him, nobody will hold him accountable. And that point, then maybe tell it to the church means tell it to everybody kind of thing. But you better be careful <laughs> that what you're doing is right uh, and it's not just some kind of uh, little personal vendetta you have. We may need to really make sure that we're not out of order. We're not going outside of that established order that God has established. And, and that should be a concern for every true believer. And he says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. And you know, the idea is that we're all to get in order according to where God has placed us within the fellowship or within the family, within, you know, the, the civil government, no matter what our position is. And, and the overruling, uh, really, factor should be that we're to be clothed with humility. There's no place for pride in the kingdom of God. And he says it plainly, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And understand, any spiritual gift or any position that God may have given you wasn't given to you because you deserve it. Okay, I'm throwing myself in here big time. You know, all of it is by God's grace. And don't forget, if you find yourself being used to lead God's people in any kind of a capacity, don't forget what Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 1. 26 through 29. This will take the pride right out of you. He, and this, an epistle is an open letter. It, it was a letter that was to be read to the church on Sunday morning when everybody's there. And so imagine you're in the congregation, or even though you're one of the leaders, but you, you're one of the Christians, you're one of the leaders, whatever, and the pastor stands up to read this epistle, and he gets to 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. He says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Think what he's saying there. Okay? <laughs> not many wise. You guys are kind of losers, you know. <laughs> you weren't very noble, you know, you're kind of scum of the earth kind of thing. <laughs> he goes on and says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise or to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things, wrap your head around that. He's called the people sitting there in church base, okay? Low lives. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No place for pride within the kingdom of God. No matter what you do, whether it's pastor, elder, assistant pastor, you know, uh, sound crew, worship leader, no place for pride there, man. God's chosen the base things, the foolish things. That's us. That's us. God didn't need any one of us. Remember that. We needed him. <laughs> Verses 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So if you're not content with where you are in the kingdom of God, within the church, whatever, well, he says, humble yourself. Recognize that you're in God's hand. And it's a mighty hand. 
and he will lift you up in his timing. Don't get your socks in a knot because you're not in the position that you think you ought to be at this point. And then he says, cast your, all your care upon him for he cares for you. You know, and really it's cast that care and every other care onto him. Humbling yourself to his rule in your life, submitting to his will for you and not kicking against it. And instead of that, cast that care on him because he cares for you. Now, it's interesting where, that con, where the context is of that verse, right? The context that that verse is in, I should say. I mean, think about it. When we read uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, when we quote it, most of us remember that verse, right? We've quoted it to people. We, we've encouraged them to cast their care, something that they're worried about, something they're concerned about. Cast, cast it on God that he, he cares for you. Well, all your care upon him. Yeah, that includes all of that other stuff. But don't miss the context. Somebody that's upset, that's concerned, that oh, I'm not where I ought to be. <laughs> you know, hey, humble yourself. You know, you worried about that? Well, cast your care on him. He cares for you. He knows what's going on. He knows if you should have got that promotion at work. He knows if you should have been placed in that ministry or, or, or this other one over here or whatever. He knows, you know, bring it to him. Cast your care on him. He cares about you. I just, you know, every time I think about that, it's like, you know, that is a real interesting deal there that, that somebody can, is concerned about their station in life or within the church, whatever. Why aren't I the pastor kind of thing? And he's just telling them, hey, relax. <laughs> You know, submit to God. Understand you're in his hand. He cares about you. Just cast that care on him. Don't get all worked up over it. And then he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It's a verse that we're all familiar with, but that word sober does include not being drunk or stoned or whatever. The definition is to be in control of one's thought process and thus not be in danger of irrational thinking. It can be translated to be sober-minded, to be well-composed in mind. Uh, that's what this means. And we have to keep in mind, especially in these last days, we see, see things ramping up against the church uh, just as hot as they are uh, against Israel now because really it's the, the devil and he's coming against anything and everything that God loves. And you're somebody that God loves. And so you've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to understand, hey, you know, we're in a war, and the enemy would love to devour me. He'd love to eat you up. And we've got to be sober-minded. We've got to be in control of our thoughts, not in some foggy stupor. Really, I mean, think about that. We've got to be alert. We've got to have our head on a swivel, prepared for the next attack. I mean, how many times have, has someone that you have commiserated with or whatever, somebody you know has been, you know, kind of crying on your shoulder, man, you know, I should have saw that coming. Oh, I should have done that, and I fell for this trap. How many times have you fallen for the trap because you weren't really paying attention? You weren't, you know... You were being sober-minded as far as, I need to be prepared, you know. doesn't mean to be paranoid, just <laughs> means that you're sober-minded, you know. Uh, the thing is, we need to be prepared for the next attack because it will come again and again. He wants to devour us. In verse 9, he says, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. See, the devil was attacking Peter's readers through persecution. They were suffering under persecution. And we looked at that uh, previously in 1 Peter. But the devil was trying to discourage them, to get them to give up on their faith in Jesus. But he says, resist him, steadfast in the faith. James says something similar in James 4, 7. He says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, resist him. Steadfast in the faith. And the thing is, if you submit to God and resist the devil, well, he'll move on to an easier target. He'll move on to somebody that's easier to scarf up. 
But again, you got to be ready. He'll be back. And actually, I don't think the devil has, the devil himself has ever attacked any of us. I think we're pretty small fish in a big pond. (laughs) Yeah, does he attack presidents and kings and, you know, those kind of people? Oh, yeah. You know, he's at work on them. But we're kind of small potatoes, really, in the grand scheme of things. Now, have we been attacked spiritually? Oh, yeah but probably by some third or fourth, fifth rate demon or something like that, you know, one of, one of the devil's minions or whatever. But they're going to be back. They're going to attack. You could, you could count on it. And Peter reminds them that, that they're not the only ones being persecuted for their faith. Like we saw a couple of weeks ago in 1 Peter 4.12, remember? Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Hey, you, your brethren are... are going through this all over the world right now, you know, the known world. In verse 10, (laughs) this kind of cracks me up. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. (laughs) It's like, after you have suffered a while? Hey, how about doing all of that stuff right now? kind of thing. I don't want to suffer for a while. I want him to answer my prayers now when I'm in the suffering right now. But folks, we've seen it time and time again. And we saw it, you know, just a couple weeks ago. It's the trials and the suffering that God uses to perfect our faith, to strengthen us and cause our roots to grow deep in him. You know, there's certain trees that while they're growing up, if they don't experience some harsh winds, then their roots won't go down real deep. And when a storm comes later on, when they're fully grown, uh, they'll get blown over because the roots aren't deep. It's the storms that cause the tree. It's just something that God has, has put in them, that when the trees are blown all over the place like sap, you know, as saplings, that those roots go way down while they're still growing and forming. And that's what God does with us. You know, he'll let some storms come. He knows what we can handle. We talked about that before. He doesn't allow us to be tempted more than we can bear. But he'll let the things come our way. He'll, he'll let us suffer some. It, but it's all in order to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle us. And he will do that. And, folks, we got to trust him, right? <laughs> We've got to just settle into the fact that we're in his hands, like he said, but he knows what he's doing in our lives. God knows. You know, that was, there's that song that says something that, you know, things aren't falling apart. They're actually falling into place, something along those lines. You know, you guys that know the songs, oh, you're, you're off the, you know, this, it says this, okay. But you get what I mean, right? <laughs> but you know what? When all the dust settles, when we're there in heaven, and we're able to look back at everything that God allowed to come our way and the way that God was involved and, and he had his hand in this and hand in that and kept us from going, we're going to praise him. We're going to glorify him because we're going to see and go, oh, that's what you were doing. <laughs> in verse 11, he says, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It all belongs to him in the first place, Right. And then finally in verses 12 through 14, he says, By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, some of your Bibles where it says by Silvanus, it, it may say Silas. That was, you know, the shortened version of his name. Silas, he was that traveling companion of Paul. Uh, remember, he was the one in the Philippian jail with Paul, praising uh, God midnight when God shook the jail. Uh, same Silas. Uh, he helped Peter pin this letter. And most believe that what he's talking about here, and she who is in Babylon, um, that, that Peter is actually using code uh, to protect the church that was in Rome and Peter himself from Nero's persecution. You know, she who is in Babylon, the she who is elect together with you, uh, most Bible scholars believe that it it was actually the church uh, where Peter was at at the time and that Babylon was actually Rome. Certainly there was a lot of Babylonian practice going on there, but Peter was in Rome during that time that he wrote this letter. 
Uh, and he spent the last several years of his life in Rome. And the Mark that he refers to as a son might not have been his actual son. Most believe that it was John Mark, Barnabas' cousin, uh, who was also in Rome around that same time period. But since Peter was married, Mark could have been Peter's actual son. Uh, but, you know, if, I'm not sure. I don't know. And if it really troubles you, when we get to heaven, you can ask him, you know. We'll have seven years to hang out and ask questions and all kinds of stuff, you know, before we come back with the Lord, right? <laughs> but he says, peace to you, uh, to, to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Lord, help us. Help us to be submissive to you to trust you that we're in your hands and you know what you're doing. Oh, Lord, that you care for us. Help us to cast our cares on you, no matter what they are, that we would be anxious for nothing. Father, help us. Lord, help us to glorify you. Whatever we do, wherever we're at, Lord, that we would be just looking for opportunities, especially this next week uh, as we celebrate Thanksgiving. Lord, may our hearts really be thankful uh, to you, and may the people around us see that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks.